Good day, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this webinar presentation. My name is Philip Payne. I am the technical lead for the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, also known as CSIAC, one of the three IAC domains in the DOD Information Analysis Centers. Uh, we operate under DTIC or the Defense Technical Information Center, which is within the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Our informative webinar series highlight current and emerging research and technology developments. It presents an opportunity, uh, opportunity for us to accelerate the DOD's leverage of these advancements by increasing awareness and fostering technical collaboration. Uh, CSIAC serves as one of the premier information research partners and curators of technology advancements and, threat and trends throughout the cybersecurity and information system science and technology community. Um, as such, our organization supports those working in the cybersecurity and information systems domain of DOD research engineering. Uh, we help do this by helping navigate the vast landscape of scientific and technical information, allowing our customers to get a head start on some of their technical projects. Uh, we provide a bunch of different research and analysis services to help unlock access to information, knowledge, and best practices from the government, industry, and academia to stimulate innovation foster collaboration and eliminate redundancy. Uh, we hope you enjoy this webinar today and we hope that it serves as a catalyst uh, for further community collaboration and improved DOD cybersecurity. Uh, before we get started today, I would like to note uh, just a couple of administrative items. First, if you're dialed in by the phone and you would like a copy of the slides, they are posted uh, to this CSI webinar announcement. You can go to csiac.org forward slash webinars and find today's webinar. When you click on it at the bottom of the announcement, it will say to view webinar PDF, click here. Uh, second, all participants are muted, uh, but feel free to chat uh, with one another using the attendee chat button on the left-hand side of the webinar screen. This will allow you to chat with each other and I'll be monitoring that chat as well. However, if you have a question uh, for our presenter today, um, which we will handle at the Q&A session at the end, please use the audience questions tool at the top center of your screen. Um, that is the icon that looks like a chat bubble. Um, that's right next to the file folder. So if you have a question, please put it there. At the end of the presentation, I will go over the Q&A. Uh, for the benefit of those on the phone, I will also read the question out loud to the presenter. Um, if you have any technical issues during the presentation, have no fear, the full presentation will be available online check back on the CSI website once the webinar is posted. The go to webinar button will take you to the YouTube link. Uh, we also will post this on MailTube as well. Um, with that said, I will now hand it off uh, to Dr. Dykstra. Thanks for that great introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to speak with you today. Uh, I am. It is afternoon for me. I am near the NSA headquarters in Maryland. I'll tell you a little bit about that in a minute. Uh, thanks for coming to this talk. It is both a human-focused talk and a technical-focused talk. Um, I gave a version of this talk at the Black Hat Security Conference this year in 2021 uh, virtually, and I have continued to update it as I think of more examples. So I hope that um, you will find it as up-to-date up -to -date and interesting and, and valuable to you as possible. This talk really is for everybody, whether or not you are in charge of cybersecurity or you just use technology, which is every single one of us. Um, I'm going to explain action bias as a very specific kind of bias in a little bit, but essentially it's, it's an urgency to act. And when we act in a hurry without planning and preparation, it can lead to errors. And it's those errors that I want to help us all prevent. So as I said, I work for the National Security Agency. I've been here for 17 years doing offensive and defensive cybersecurity. I earned a PhD in computer science while I was here. And now as a senior executive, get to help guide the research, the practice that we do. The office that I work in is called the Cybersecurity Collaboration Center. Uh, this is a relatively new two-year-old organization. We are in a building outside of NSA's fence line. And we work with industry partners, particularly in the defense industrial base, uh, to help make sure that they learn things that NSA is uniquely uh, optimized to know, and they can help us uh, also do our jobs better. So we do that work together. 
it, it's work that I love and have continued to do for a long time. I learned about 10 years ago as a technologist that the intersection of technology and other fields was really especially interesting to me. So computer science and psychology, computer science and economics, uh, those intersections, I think, are really important, interesting problems. And it's the area that I've grown into in my career. I met about a year ago, Doug Huff, who unfortunately isn't with us. He is a professor at the Johns Hopkins uh, School for Public Health. And he wrote a book called Irrationality in Healthcare. And he teaches doctors uh, how to understand and avoid and deal with cognitive bias. Uh, and he studies behavioral economics. I found his book really fascinating, even though it didn't mention computers even one time. But nearly every page taught me something about my field. And I reached out to him and said, would you like to think about this problem together? And so for the last bit, we have uh, been exchanging notes and meeting. And he has taught me a lot about behavioral economics and psychology. And I have taught him a lot about cybersecurity. And we found that the, this presentation sort of bore out of that uh, that collaboration, quite honestly. So I hope you have the opportunity to run into people in related fields as well, um, and that it turns out as productively for you. So here's what I'm going to talk about. I want to uh, at least motivate the talk by talking about traditional cybersecurity goals. How do we as practitioners today basically approach our cybersecurity goals? Then I'm going to come back and reintroduce cognitive bias generally and action bias specifically, um, and then talk about how I have seen action bias in cybersecurity and countermeasures. What can we do about it? For anybody that's in the research domain, I would love to give you a couple ideas at the end of the presentation. I wrote a book on cybersecurity science. I love the application of the research method to problems like this, and it is not solved. There's a lot of work yet to do, and I think really interesting opportunities for you or your organizations as well. So as I said, I've been working in this field for about 17 years. And I think I share the sentiment with most people in cybersecurity, which is, you know what, we're trying to prevent and mitigate harm. We want to help keep people safe and protected, even if cybersecurity isn't the average person's primary goal. People want to be able to do online banking, share photos with their friends, conduct their business um, in a safe, secure, private manner. And cybersecurity should be there to help them do those things. And in all of my years of academic training, I learned a lot about technology. I learned how to uh, keep systems secure, keep bad activity from happening, detect when it's happening, uh, understand what's going on in a, in a compromised system, and then remediate, try and keep the bad, keep the harm out. As I've thought more about this, uh, it occurs to me that people who conduct cybersecurity have a different frame of reference, a different frame of mind than a user would be. And we also, in cybersecurity professionals, have a different frame of mind from senior executives. So imagine a user turns on her computer tomorrow and it's been infected with ransomware. That dangerous red screen comes up and says, pay us uh, some Bitcoins uh, or you don't get your data. Now, the user very rationally wants their data back. They are not interested in uh, going to extraordinary measures and they probably will take drastic action to try and save their, their precious information. They might do things that look crazy to a computer scientist. They might clear their web cache. They might unplug the computer or disconnect from the internet. But from their perspective, that is the right thing to do. They're trying to maximize what they're doing. A cyber defender is a little bit like a firefighter. I once had a red plastic firefighter's hat uh, in one of my offices because it felt like that's what a lot of my job was. We are often called to put out fires. And we are motivated as cybersecurity people to maximize cybersecurity. My goal in general is not to maximize a, a business function or the ability for somebody to share information. My job is to keep the system as secure as possible. And from my seat, that is the rational choice. 
a user often says to their IT department, well, security is getting in the way. Uh, it makes my computer too slow. Uh, I can't get to the websites that I need to get to. But from my cybersecurity desk, I am achieving better cybersecurity, um, even though it is contrary to the maybe the, the views of the user. Now, a CEO or a chief information security officer, they're going to make even different decisions. Um, their goals are either to maximize the business, the profits of a corporation, for example, uh, for me in government and you if you're in DOD as well, to make sure the nation is as protected as possible. And to some users, the choices that a CISO makes also look crazy. Why am I not allowed to send email attachments? Why do I have to log in six times to get to my desktop, whatever it might be? Why can't I check email on my phone? Um, but the CISO's job in life is to make sure that the network is protected. And some CISOs can get fired from their jobs if that fails. And so they make very strict decisions sometimes um, about implementing cybersecurity. And I'll be honest with you, sometimes in my role as a defender, I don't understand those decisions. And in my role as a user, I also don't understand those decisions. So whatever your role is in an enterprise, we are generally making the right decisions for us. And an economist would say, that is totally natural. Uh, we are not perfect human beings. We make irrational choices from time to time, but we are trying to do the best that we can wherever we are. So let's think about crisis for a second. I, I used ransomware as one example. Let me give you one more. In 2014, on a Tuesday, Sony uh, Pictures Entertainment shut down their entire network for 9,000 people uh, 24 hours after they detected an attack that was later uh, attributed to the North Koreans. And Sony was going to put out some movies. The North Koreans didn't like it. And two days in, 24 hours into the detection of that event, they shut down the entire network. It was later determined that the attackers probably had been there for at least a year. They had infected computers, they had stolen data, and not just movies, but personal information and emails. Um, but the security staff said, we don't understand the situation. We're going to take drastic measures, react very forcefully and immediately, turn off the computer, shut down the Wi-Fi. Um, and I use this as an example of normal human reaction to crisis. We are trying to get control over a situation that we don't understand. And if we don't have a really good methodical plan in place, long before the crisis ever happens, we won't know what to do. Uh, or the decisions that we will make might waste time. It might use money that we didn't expect, uh, more money than it might necessarily cost, that preparation would have helped prepare us for. So that's where I want to go is Sony took immediate reaction, and it doesn't seem like they had a mature, robust process in place to know what to do. So with that said, let me introduce cognitive bias. This is probably a term you have heard in training, in popular media, or maybe you've read some books. If it's brand new to you, I commend to you a book called Thinking Fast and Slow, the picture on the screen. Daniel Kahneman won the Nobel Prize in Economics uh, for work that he and Amos Traversky, his research partner, have done over many decades uncovering cognitive bias. Um, cognitive biases are errors in our thinking. Uh, you probably are familiar with things like gender bias or age bias uh, in things like hiring and team formation. Biases, if you looked them up on Wikipedia, you'd probably find around a hundred of them that have been named that are all a little bit different and they cause our brains to work in different kinds of ways. Kahneman uh, eventually described this in that book, Thinking Fast and Slow, uh, in, in a way that our brains process information. The first way is that we have this very slow, deliberate, careful thinking, which he called system two thinking. And if you think about learning to drive a car, that was brand new to you at one time, and you probably had to think very carefully about how to drive, uh, how to get to work, how to go through the drive-through fast food restaurant for the first time. 
But if you've been driving for many years, you don't have to think carefully about it all the time. And Kahneman calls that system one thinking, which is a fast, automatic uh, shortcut for your brain. And this is a really good thing. If your brain had to think carefully about the entire world around you all the time, it would be very debilitating. Your life would grind to a halt. Your brain couldn't process information. So we need this fast automatic thinking. The trouble happens when that fast automatic thinking replaces what should be slow, careful thinking. Um, and so when we start to make errors, it's often because we're using system one thinking and not system two. So you can see at the bottom of the screen, for example, some of these biases. Let me give you one example before we get to action bias. In research, uh, it is very common to experience something called confirmation bias. And this is a, the brain's quick heuristic shortcut um, to looking at a bunch of information and our brain naturally hones in on things that confirm what we want to be true or the thing that we're looking for. And as a researcher, that's a really uh, bad state to be in. We want to consider all of the evidence uh, in an experiment, not just the, the, the data that confirms what we want to be true. But this is a shortcut that our brain is making unless we deliberately slow down and push that bias aside. Um, but that takes some cognitive effort and it takes some experience. But we can learn. Uh, we can't make cognitive bias or confirmation bias go away, but we can keep it in check. Another of these that I was very unfamiliar with until I talked to Dr. Hoff was action bias. And I'm actually going to explain it to you in a non-technical example before I give you the cybersecurity examples. So in 2007, the New York Times published an article about a research study of professional goalkeepers. And if you are familiar with the game of soccer, international football, you know that this is a very high stake situation where a penalty kicker is one-on-one -on -one with a goalkeeper. And the action takes place in a split second. The, uh, the offensive player decides where to kick the ball, and the goalie needs to decide how to block the shot. It turns out even elite professional goalkeepers aren't very good at this. In general, they stop about one in six attempts. What the surprising research result was is that while most of the time the goalkeeper decides during the kick to jump to the left or the right to cover the goal, the goalkeeper would be better suited not to move, to stay in the center of the goal. And the research showed that that goalkeeper could block not one in six, but one in three goals uh, attempts on the goal. The trouble is, if you're the fans watching this game, or you're the coach, and you see the goalkeeper stand in the middle and not move, it feels wrong. It feels like they're not acting or that they're paralyzed uh, and unable to make a decision. On the outside, it doesn't look like this is a deliberate choice, even though it would be the rational best choice for that goalie to do, which is just to stand there uh, and stop more shots. And so it's really unappealing from the outside, even though it is the right thing to do. So this is, this is action bias. It's our tendency to want to move, to take some action, even if it's the wrong action, just to do something. Don't just stand there, do something. Um, and so it's a very natural human tendency. It's built into all of us um, and one that we see in cybersecurity and can keep in check. We'll get to that. So where do I see it in cyber? Let's start with an obvious example, which is phishing. When a hacker sends a phishing email, the hacker is playing to the fact that you will act quickly. They are creating a sense of urgency, like your account has been compromised, click here to recover it. Or you've been charged $1,000, click here to see the purchase. They, the attacker does not want you to think slowly and carefully about whether this is a real message. The, the attacker is appealing to this action bias. Ransomware is another one. Um, ransomware also appeals to a sense of urgency. There's a countdown clock generally that says, you know what, you have 24 hours and the clock is counting down until you make a decision. And they don't want you to think carefully and prepare. They want you to take immediate action, try and get some control. 
Another example. In 2013, the Associated Press had a Twitter account that got hacked. And when the attackers got control of the account, what they did was tweet a message that there had been two bombs that went off at the White House. And almost immediately, the stock market crashed. And when people looked at this information later, they learned that we had coded action bias into algorithms, which is these algorithms were designed to look at open source information, including the AP Twitter handle. And if something bad happened to immediately sell stocks, and that is precisely what happened. We had coded action bias into the algorithm. Nobody bothered to check whether the information was true. Nobody called the White House to confirm. The algorithms just did what they were told. Uh, I think this is a really interesting case where it isn't the human taking the action bias, but the fact that we had written it into programs. I think the Sony example is another one where Sony didn't know what the state of their, their uh, compromise was. And so they felt they had to do something. I think if they had been more prepared, we would have seen them take different action. They probably wouldn't have shut down the entire network. Um, and it probably didn't help. If anything, it's, it's halted the business for quite a long time. They couldn't do their normal jobs. Um, but if they had understood that the attack was already done, that Sony had already done the damage, um, shutting down the network probably did very little. If anything, it was more costly. One last example. Uh, Uber, a couple of years ago, 2013, 14, had a data breach. And when the executives at Uber learned about the data breach, which had millions of drivers, driver's license, names, dates of birth, pretty bad thing. What, the, what Uber decided to do was to pay off the hackers. They paid them $100,000 and the hackers promised uh, to delete the data and to make the problem go away, uh, essentially like a ransom. That probably was an instance of action bias as well. It certainly was a cover up. And actually some of those executives were later charged with crimes because the disclosure of data breaches in some cases in the United States is a legal requirement. And so it seemed like Uber did not have the right preparation in place and they hadn't practiced these plans to know what to do um, before an incident occurred. And so when they ended up in the middle of a fire, they made a decision that was not the best decision. At this point, you might be objecting to my proposition and say, that he's, Josiah is just telling us to watch bad things happen. I assure you I am not. <laughs> uh, sometimes we need to do immediate firefighting. We have to stop the bleeding. We can't just sit around and watch bad things happen. Some things very much do require immediate action. What I'm suggesting though, is not to make hurried decisions without preparation. Um, Instead of making immediate choices that are rushed and lead to bad outcomes, you can move your preparation before the incident ever occurs so that when it does, you know what to do and you can make a choice that you've thought carefully about. So having a plan, following the plan, practicing the plan, that's where I want you to go with this. In the extreme, I think that action bias leads to this really, really dangerous situation of us often senior leadership saying, we just suffered a very major event. We had a data breach. We had an insider. We had a denial of service. You know what company, you know what employees? That can never happen again. I think never again are the two most dangerous words in cybersecurity. Let me tell you why. First, it sets an impossible goal there will always be more hacks. There will always be more attacks. Um, hackers are incentivized to keep trying. They, they have no reason to stop. No matter how much cybersecurity that you do, they're going to keep trying to break in. And so if we tell our staff, never allow another attack, that is crazy. We can never get to zero risk. I think a lot of us intuitively understand that cybersecurity is not a, a guarantee, that we, we mitigate some risk and we accept some risk. But to a CISO, 
they often think, it, it, imagine you went to your CISO and said, how many cyber attacks would you like to happen? Would, would, would you like to allow to happen in 2022? They would not be very happy with your question. They want zero. In reality, zero is irrational. It will never be zero. There will always be more attacks. So it sets an impossible goal for the staff. And it's a really frustrating thing as an employee to say, well, I'm trying to reach this unattainable goal that I know I can never get to. Um, and so it leads to things like burnout uh, because we have set impossible goals. It can also lead to irrational resource usage. Um, if the goal is never again, that leads to a sort of infinite cost. And you might buy all the security products. You might keep hiring security professionals to try and get to this goal when in fact you've overspent. At some point, there's too much cybersecurity. It just doesn't make sense. If you're spending a billion dollars on cybersecurity for a company that's only worth a million, you will still never get to perfect security and you'll have wasted a lot of money. Um, and so this never again, such a really unfortunate goal. And I think we should rethink that, that uh, phrasing, set different, different kinds of goals and different kinds of metrics. Now, let's talk a little bit about countermeasures. Um, as I just said, there's no cure for action bias. And so there are wrong countermeasures to this problem as well. Unplugging the computer is almost never the right situation, uh, even in a crisis, unless you have thought carefully and beforehand that that is what you want to do to mitigate a particular problem. In general, unplugging is not the right countermeasure. Um, there are lots of things that you can do. And let me give you four that I've thought about. The first one is that traditional risk management actually should help avoid action bias to some extent. If a corporation has done compliance or mandatory risk management, what that should produce is a list of where is the things of value, which computers on the network are the most important. Not every computer is the same. Risk management is the way of saying um, which of the systems should we mitigate first and which ones should we mitigate later? And that risk management doesn't need to be just used in a crisis, but when a new vulnerability is, is discovered or a new patch comes out, which computers do we patch first? And so formal risk management would help the situation because then in the crisis you would know, oh, we need to protect this information first. We need to make sure that um, all of our resources are devoted to that. Not everybody does traditional formal risk management. And I think that leads to worse action bias in a crisis. Number two is culture change. And under this umbrella is where I lump training. I think training is important, but it cannot be or it will not be the ultimate solution. I have to take bias training every year. And I think it helps build a culture um, that understands, that recognizes it in the workplace, in the normal work settings. I have never been taught about action bias. I think it's worth telling our employees, especially our senior leadership, what it is and that it can happen. But culture change is not immediate. It takes a long time for people to internalize this kind of training and to practice it. It's not enough just to say this exists, um, but people need to be put in the situation to actually practice it. The same way that we run fire drills with children before there's a fire. Um, we run fire drills in my building, which is let's build the motor memory so that when the crisis happens, we don't have to think, we're not scurrying around trying to decide what to do. We all know we walk down, down uh, the stairwell and we walk outside and meet in this place. That's a culture change that will take some time. One, one idea that, um, Danny Kahneman has suggested that I will propose to you here is something called a decision observer. And a decision observer would be a person who sits in meetings or um, watches decisions in your enterprise, in your company or agency, and has a checklist for what bias looks like and can call it out as it happens. 
um, they might watch a, a, a decision being made and say, it looks like you are all succumbing to action bias. Have you thought about these other things? That isn't a perfect solution. And there's lots, Kahneman talks about the considerations for, for that being successful. But a decision observer is one thing you could think about in your environment. Next is leadership education. Uh, in culture change, I talked about education for sort of everyone in the enterprise. Leadership, whether it is a CISO in a company or senior military leaders or a board of directors or even just shareholders of a company, they're the ones like the crowd at the soccer game. And they need to understand or learn that when it looks like the enterprise is not moving, sometimes that is a deliberate choice. Sometimes the goalie is staying in the middle because that is the better thing to do, but it would be frustrating if you were a shareholder to watch Sony not act. So part of that is learning how to communicate. How do you tell shareholders, we understand what's going on, we're looking into it. Um, I haven't had to do this in my professional experience, but helping people understand Sometimes the thing that we do is deliberately waiting, is watchful waiting, um, but that needs to be taught to leadership. And I think that's a learned skill. Um, sometimes they just expect, they like us are humans, they expect action. And we don't wanna just waste their time with security theater, as Bruce Schneider likes to say, uh, make it look like we're doing something when in fact it isn't actually very valuable. Let's get rid of that and help them understand, here's how we're going to make decisions when this happens. The most important one on this list to me is slowing down. And what I mean is not slowing down in the middle of a crisis, but slowing down our decision-making by doing it before the crisis ever happens. So shifting our thinking uh, to when we are not riled up, when we are not in the middle of what psychologists call a hot state, we're very emotional in the middle of a crisis. We're very focused, um, but it impacts our thinking. Uh, the psychologist would call the, con the, the converse of that thinking in a cold state. In the cold state, you can sit in your conference room around a table and talk about what would we do if there was a data breach. And because you're not influenced in that situation by um, the other factors of it actually happening, you can think more clearly, you can think more slowly, uh, system one, system two style deliberate thinking, and you'll make better choices. You can also do this not only by sitting around the table, but by practicing not in the crisis. So standard operating procedures are documents that lots of organizations write that say, when this kind of a crisis happens, when, when we have a phishing compromise, here are the steps that we're going to do. And it, it produces a checklist so that when the crisis happens, you don't have to decide what to do. You only have to follow the checklist. Uh, those are sometimes called playbooks. Um, lots of us have done tabletop exercises or red team exercises. These are, again, ways to practice, to build the muscle memory of what needs to be done. I, I will acknowledge that in a very high ops tempo organization, it's difficult to pull people away from their actual jobs to practice something that hasn't happened yet. And I think it is essential. I think it is a really important use of their time because when a crisis inevitably happens, we need them to be prepared. We can't afford to say, well, we didn't have time to run the fire drill uh, until the fire happens. We must do the preparation. In medicine, they have uh, developed something called a pre-mortem. You probably are familiar with something called a post-mortem, which is after an event happens or after the problem uh, has passed us by, we look backwards and say, what happened? What could we have done differently? How could we have prevented this? But it means that some bad event already happened, and that's too bad. That's unfortunate. In cybersecurity, I think we need to be more proactive. And so a pre-mortem is sitting down and saying, imagine that in the future, it hasn't happened yet, but imagine in the future, we have an insider threat. Um, what can we do to detect that? And what might go wrong? Why would it be that we might not be able to detect that right away? 
because it lets us be more proactive instead of just reactionary and not just fighting fires, but thinking about where might fire be a problem in this environment. Uh, where do we need to invest more money? And so it helps us make more careful, deliberate uh, kinds of decisions. You know, soccer players or elite athletes in general sometimes talk about the game moving in slow motion. Obviously, this is a metaphor. The way that I interpret it is that it's slow. It seems slow to them in the moment because of all the preparation they've done. They have so much experience, so many games already played, so much training, practice uh, and preparation that they can anticipate what's going to happen and be ready before it happens. Um, I think that would be a great analogy if in the middle of a cyber crisis, we could say, oh, it felt like it was moving in slow motion. Uh, and so even if bad things are happening, we are making good decisions and protecting the enterprise um, because we have done better preparation. So here's a couple of research ideas for you. Um, number one, it would be great if there were more ways to validate threats. One of the reasons people jump into immediate action is they think a threat is real and don't have another way uh, to determine the validity of that threat. Is this email real or phishing? Is this denial of service going to impact me or not? Um, it would be great if there were more um, ways for people, decision makers to validate threats, uh, to get additional evidence that says, you know what, I'm only 50% sure that this is real. How can I validate that? We need to build that into algorithms like the AP Twitter thing as well. Number two is to help the humans get out of the rut of reflexive uh, responses and to make deeper thought a little bit more normalized. Um, how could we help, for example, when somebody, before they click a link in an email, to not just open it without thinking whether it could be a phishing website, but to slow down and think about, should I actually click on that? That comes up in cybersecurity training, but in the actual everyday environment when we're busy, I heard a, a kind of interesting proposal last year, something called deliberate friction. And we think about trying to make security easy to use, get out of the way of the user. What if in situations where it's really important that they make good, careful choices, that we actually slowed them down. Imagine they had to count to 10 before they could click a link in an email. Um, some of you would be very frustrated by that, I understand, but it might prevent some people from clicking on links that otherwise would compromise them if they had to deliberately slow down in really important decisions. How many people know a colleague, a family member who gets the web page that says, this is a, we think this is a dangerous website, are you sure you want to go on? How many of them just say, yes, they just want to go on? Or they're downloading an app for their phone and it seems a little bit shady, but they just want to play the game. They just want to be entertained. And so they don't think carefully and slowly when it matters. The last area here is one that I know a small group of people in cybersecurity work on, which is mental models. And a mental model is how do you internalize in your brain how a complicated system works and the, the impact of your choices. For example, I am not very knowledgeable about automobiles. I don't really know how my car works. And when it starts to make a sound or a smell, I don't understand in my brain what might be wrong. I can't say, oh, that smell, that's clearly burning oil. Here's what I need to do. I just take it to the mechanic. That's a little bit of action bias for me because I don't understand what's going on. And I see the same thing in cybersecurity. People don't understand the impact of clicking on a, a link in an email. They don't have a mental model in their head for what might go wrong or what actually happens when I click on that link. So that's a little bit of education, um, but it's not just teaching people how the internet works. How do we help them internalize in their own way of thinking? What are the consequences of what I'm going to do? Um, and that takes a lot of careful preparation. I don't know the answer to that, but I think evolving those mental models might help us in action bias. You may remember in 2009, uh, Sully Sullenberger was the captain of an airline 
where both engines um, stopped working. They ran into birds and the air, the, the pilots, Ole Solenberger had to decide what to do. In the end, he landed that plane in the Hudson River and saved 155 people. Nobody died. Uh, there, were, there were injuries, but no deaths. And he was criticized later for the amount of time that it took him to decide what to do. And lots of experts said, you should have just immediately turned around and you could have gotten to the airport. You didn't have to land in the Hudson. And after lots of investigation, it turned out he did precisely the right thing. And this surprised a lot of people. Kelly Solenberger actually had this quote on the screen in his pocket on every flight. A delay is better than a disaster. And the situation of this flight actually had never occurred before. There was no playbook. Uh, nobody had trained him what to do. It was miraculous that he was an expert in safety and he was an, a very experienced pilot. And I think we can all learn a lesson from this quote and his action in that all of that preparation allowed him to go into a new uh, crisis, a new situation, and make an informed, uh, positive choice that saved 155 people's lives. Let me give you another quote. Former President Eisenhower said something like, plans are worthless, but planning is everything. And I really like that quote which is even if you don't have a playbook for a new hack, even if the North Koreans have never attacked Sony before, if you are in the, the, the habit and the practice of doing preparation, you will respond better in new situations. So learning how to prepare uh, and taking the time and making it a priority, taking it seriously, will make your organization more resilient, whatever might happen. Um, and too many of us, need to make that a priority. So a couple of takeaways. Um, I think right away, it would be great if you could help me spread the message about action bias. Raise the awareness that a lot of the incidents we see in cyber are actually um, a kind of action bias, even though that phrase has never been put on it before. And by labeling them that way, I think we can get a better handle about how to do better in the future. So tell your colleagues, tell your peers, this is a real thing uh, to be on the, the lookout for it. You can do that today if you want to. If you're in a, in a position to do so in the next couple of months, I would say, look at your plans, look at your standard operating procedures. Do they need to be created? Do they need to be updated? Um, make sure that they are current and applicable so that you're not caught unprepared when you need a plan. The other thing that I think is really important is to develop some metrics. Uh, what does it look like if we are successful? Uh, what does it look like if we fail uh, in our action bias uh, in the future? Does it mean that we spend more money? For example, you could say, you know what? We didn't have an SOP the last time we had an incident. But after we created the SOP, our response time went from one week to one day. It went from a loss of $10 million to $1 million. Whatever the appropriate metrics and goals are for you, that's a way to measure your progress here. Then in the longer term, run a tabletop exercise. Uh, take people off the job and actually have them practice those SOPs, those plans, to make sure that they work and to make sure that you build the muscle memory into being able to do it. Hopefully you never have, I mean, we don't want attacks every day. We don't want to have to do this all the time, but we don't want to get rusty in the interim because these attacks will happen again. I guarantee it. And work on the culture change. Continue the education, the training, uh, educate senior leadership that the next time this happens, you know, one of our options is going to be to take a breath and to get more information. That doesn't mean we're not taking it seriously. It doesn't mean we're ignoring a critical issue. But after we stop the bleeding, sometimes it's going to look like we're not acting and actually we are taking very careful, deliberate choices for the enterprise. So lots of things that I think you can put into practice. I think humans are really critical to cybersecurity. I learned a lot about uh, technology in my PhD years of education. Um, 
I wish I had to take courses in psychology. <laughs> uh, and so I'm really spreading the gospel now as a technology person. Go learn a little bit. Um, on the issue of bias, none of us are immune. I fall for this. You will fall for this. Our enterprises will. And so being prepared uh, and having that practice will lead to more careful, consistent, and rational action. You are welcome to email me at any time. The NSA general addresses are here. Um, but please reach out and I would love to talk to you and happy to take any questions uh, that you have right now. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, presentation. Um, it was very informative, very interesting to me, uh, even personally with uh, my experience playing soccer a long, long time ago as a youth, I can relate to the, uh, to the analogy with the PKs and, and the goal kickers. So, um, just a different way to kind of look at things. Um, I think us lots of times in the cybersecurity world will focus uh, a lot of times on just um, many different technical solutions and um, technical countermeasures, but um, looking at the psychology of it is, as well was, was kind of refreshing. Um, but uh, thank you again for the webinar. Um, I don't see any questions as of yet. Um, if, you, if you have any questions, um, please use the... Uh, the audience questions tab um, at the top uh, middle of your screen. Um, I do know that we were having some technical difficulties with um, some people unable to um, join the webinar, at least at the beginning of when it started. Um, I think we were able to address most of those. Um, if not, I will point you to uh, our website where the, the PDF of the slides is available. Um, within a day or two, we will also upload this um, to YouTube as well as MillTube. Mil um, with that said, I believe we do just have a couple questions um, coming in now. Okay, um, Diego Maldonado uh, would just like to publicly say thank you for your outstanding presentation, very informative. Um, Dr. Dykstra has also um, been kind enough to share his personal email um, with 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 us all via the attendee chat. Oh, I saw Gary posted a question as well, which are, uh, what, what are the two most dangerous words? And I just want to say that in my view, it, they are the phrase never again, uh, which I mean as sort of the extreme uh, view that we can try and prevent every possible cyber attack. I think that's impossible. I think it's a dangerous goal to set for our organizations um, and that we we don't need to have that as a goal. We can recognize there is risk that we can't mitigate. Um, and often that is the most appropriate thing to do. All right, sounds good. Um, ending a little early today, but that's fine. I don't see any other questions as of right now. Um, this was very well received. This was actually one of the first, and it definitely will not be the last uh, CSI webinars that was cross promoted uh, through our sister organizations, HDI, which is Homeland Defense, and DSI, which was Defense Systems. Um, so hopefully that didn't cause any issues on the technical side. Um, but I would like to give a hat tip to our to our outreach department um, promoting this webinar um, as, as widely as as, the, as they did. Um, with that said, we did we just have a, another question that did come in as well. Um, this question comes from Nicholas Jankowski. Um, his question is, every federal employee takes yearly cybersecurity training to the point where it's mind numbing and repetitive. How do we factor your ideas here into improving that? That's a really interesting question. And I've read a lot of research about how to make training more effective. The, there are certainly studies out there that say, you know what, it doesn't matter at all. <laughs> it doesn't actually make people behave better in the way that we think it should. Um, and I have lots of thoughts about training in general. I think it would be great to build into cybersecurity training what to do when things inevitably go wrong. Um, sure, we need to make sure people understand what is phishing. And I don't like cybersecurity training to be all about fear mongering, um, but it would be good to help people practice. What, one way that some companies do this is with phishing simulations. Um, they practice the behavior on a routine basis. They send people fake emails and see who clicks on them, not as a punishment, but as a learning opportunity so that we keep the, the muscle memory going all the time. 
Thank you. Sounds good. Uh, and I believe that's all we have right now. Um, this was definitely a well-received webinar. I'd like to thank Dr. Dykstra once again. Um, with that being said, um, as you know, we do our monthly webinars. Um, this will be it for 2021. Um, our next one is, is in late January um, related to physical cybersecurity. So with that said, um, I will log off at this point. Uh, I would like to wish all our members happy holidays as well as happy new year. Um, and I will see you at the next webinar. Thank you.